The protagonist of the show is a peculiar girl named Wednesday Adams. Despite being only 13, the little girl barely shows any emotions and has a weird obsession with death. She is also infamous for wearing black and white gothic clothing, which everyone finds strange. In the first scene, Wednesday arrives at her high school with a creepy look on her face. Inside her locker, she finds her brother Pugsley bound with an apple in his mouth. As she shoves him out, suddenly, Wednesday has a vision wherein she sees who tortured her brother. Here, we get to know that she is not a normal child. Wednesday has the ability to see someone's past as well as their future just by touching them. Once she finds out that a group of bullies from the swim team are behind this, she walks into the swimming room with two bags full of piranhas. Then she casually unleashes the bloodthirsty piranhas in the pool. As the bullies swim for their lives in horror, Wednesday makes it clear that nobody picks on her brother except her. Cut to the next scene. We're introduced to Wednesday's parents, Morticia and Gomez. The two are fed up with their daughter's shenanigans and have decided to send her to the prestigious Nevermore Academy. It turns out that all students in this academy have supernatural abilities and they are taught lessons on how to control them. Morticia and Gomez are also alumni of the same academy, which indicates that they too have superpowers. Meanwhile, a hiker embarks on a solo journey through the woods near the Nevermore Academy. Unfortunately, after just a few minutes, an unknown creature attacks him and finishes him off. The local sheriff finds the mutilated body later and begins surveying the area. Surprisingly, we learn that this grisly murder isn't the first of its kind. There have been numerous similar incidents as of late. Next, Wednesday arrives at the academy and meets Principal Larissa Weems, who seamlessly runs Nevermore. She introduces her to her roommate, Enid, a werewolf, who's the polar opposite of Wednesday in every way imaginable. Enid is a down-to-earth girl with vibrantly colored decorations on her side of the room, while Wednesday loves all things black and goth. Later, Enid gives Wednesday a grand tour of the academy, while pointing out the main school groups, fangs, furs, stoners, and scales. Fangs are vampires, furs are werewolves, stoners are potheads, uh, uh, gorgons with snakes on their heads, and scales are sirens who have the ability to manipulate people. Enid also shows her the most popular girl in school, Bianca Barclay, a gorgeous siren, and her ex-boyfriend Xavier Thorpe, a death artist who can transform his drawings into reality. Meanwhile, as the Adams family departs in their car, Gomez releases Thing, a chopped off living hand. Thing is tasked with keeping watch over their daughter. The following day, Wednesday joins fencing class, where she is pitted against the impressive Bianca. After a bit of back and forth, the girls end up with equal points, so they decide to remove their masks and fight until someone draws blood first. Soon enough, a brutal battle erupts, with both of them matching each other stride for stride. However, at the end, Bianca ultimately emerges victorious when she slashes a small cut on Wednesday's cheek. Later, as Wednesday exits the infirmary after getting patched up, she is almost crushed to death by a falling stone gargoyle. Luckily, the death artist, Xavier, arrives just in time and pushes her out of the way. Shortly after, Wednesday returns to her room, but she suspects that someone is watching her. Hence, she searches the room and eventually finds the hand, Thing. Realizing that it's her parents doing, Wednesday threatens the hand to be loyal to her or else she will lock him up in a drawer. Terrified, Thing vows to be faithful. Due to Wednesday's piranha prank, she has to take mandatory therapy sessions. So, Principal Larissa drives her to her therapy session in Jericho, a small town outside of Nevermore. She meets her therapist, but doesn't open up about anything. Instead, Wednesday has another idea in mind. She excuses herself to the restroom and escapes through the window. Once outside, she accidentally stumbles into a man. Suddenly, she sees a vision where she witnesses the man's death. Terrified, Wednesday goes to a nearby coffee shop. There, she encounters the sheriff's son, Tyler, who's also a barista. Tyler's experiencing some mechanical difficulties with his espresso machine. The directions are inexplicably in Italian, but thankfully, Wednesday can read Italian. She fixes the device effortlessly and in return, asks for a lift to the nearest bus stop. But before Tyler can reply, suddenly, a trio of bullies wearing pilgrim costumes arrive at the store and taunt her. Wednesday tries ignoring them, but when she can't take it any longer, she fights back and easily smacks them down. After a while, Principal Larissa arrives at the store with the sheriff and notices the carnage. Enraged, she berates Wednesday before driving her away from the town. On their way back to the academy, they pass a terrible car wreck. The victim is the same man who Wednesday saw in her vision earlier.
Later that night, she plays a haunting song on her cello in the dorm balcony. It's a full moon, and several werewolves can be heard howling in the background. However, Enid, who is a werewolf herself, reveals that she's not joining them because she cannot transform herself. Meanwhile, Thing pops by Tyler's room and asks him to call Wednesday. Although terrified, he obliges, and the two start video chatting. Wednesday asks Tyler to meet her at the Harvest Fair the following day, claiming that it will be fun. However, in reality, she just wants to escape the Academy. While at the fair, we see Larissa watching over Wednesday like a hawk. Despite this, the goth teenager somehow manages to catch up with Tyler. The two almost escape the place, but just then, Wednesday stumbles into one of her classmates, Rowan. He immediately runs into the woods, and since Wednesday touched him, she has a vision. Rowan has been brutally mauled to death by someone. Terrified, she has a change of heart and goes after him to impart the news. But before she can say anything, Rowan uses his telekinesis ability and secures her high up in a tree. He then reveals that his mother, a powerful seer, envisioned Wednesday destroying the Nevermore Academy 25 years ago. Hence, Rowan believes that he has to kill her before anything bad can happen. He then starts choking her telekinetically. Geez, at least buy her telekinetic dinner first. But suddenly, a massive monster leaps in, tears Rowan apart, and vanishes into thin air. Wednesday stands over his mutilated body and sees the illustration his mother supposedly drew of her. Soon after, police officers, led by the sheriff begin looking for Rowan's body, but are unable to find it. As expected, the sheriff does not believe Wednesday's statement about a monster attacking Rowan and thinks it was a Nevermore student instead. An officer disrupts their conversation, and surprisingly, we see Rowan, who is very much alive. When Wednesday arrives at her room, she notices that her roommate Enid is too preoccupied with the Poe Cup competition, an annual boat riding game. Later, she tries talking to Rowan, but Principal Larissa informs her that she has been expelled for a reason she can't share. As a result, Wednesday reverts to Plan B and asks Thing to keep an eye on Rowan. The scene then cuts to Rowan, who has arrived at the train station, with Thing following closely behind. After observing the surroundings, he covertly heads to the restroom and changes his appearance into that of an old man. Unfortunately, Thing loses track of him and misses this transformation. Later, the old man changes to Principal Larissa. This reveals that she is actually a shapeshifter, and for some reason, she is covering up Rowan's murder. Left with no options, Wednesday ventures into the woods to look for Rowan's murder clues. She is accompanied by Tyler, who is stalking his dad. After a while, she finds Rowan's glasses, and as she picks them up, she has a vision. In the vision, she sees a purple book, from which Rowan got the drawing. Wasting no time, Wednesday confronts her class teacher about the book, and the latter reveals that it belonged to an old student society called the Nightshades. However, the society has long since disbanded. After school, Wednesday sneaks into Rowan's room to look for the book. She finds a mask underneath his bed, but before she can leave, Xavier arrives. It turns out he is Rowan's roommate. Wednesday quickly hides under the bed, and right then, Bianca also arrives to visit her ex. She overhears their conversation and learns that Bianca is planning to crush Enid in the upcoming boat riding competition. Hence, as soon as she returns to her room, Wednesday decides to help Enid by joining the competition so that they can take Bianca down. The next day, Wednesday and Enid gear up for the competition. As there are no rules, it is all fair game, and Bianca is using this to her advantage. There are four teams, and the game is that they have to row their boat to a destination and back. Whoever is the first one to arrive at the finish line without being knocked out in the lake is declared the winner. As the contest begins, Bianca hints at one of her friends who is ready to sabotage the other boats. The friend, who turns out to be a mermaid, dives into the lake and destroys one of the boats, knocking the team out. Thankfully, Wednesday and Enid are prepared. So, with the help of Thing, they manage to capture the mermaid. However, during the contest, Wednesday has another vision. This time, she sees a blonde hair version of herself, and that version tells her she is the key. Confused, Wednesday snaps into reality, only to find that Bianca's team is leading the race. Unwilling to give up, she and Enid decide to play dirty. They use Bianca's underhand methods against her and finally win the competition. With this, a non-siren team has won the esteemed competition for the first time in four decades. Later, the winning team is honored by Principal Larissa, who hands Enid the Poe Cup trophy. However, Wednesday is unable to withstand the attention, so she finds solace with Edgar Allan Poe, a former student of the Nevermore Academy. Suddenly, she sees a symbol underneath the stone book he's holding. It is the same symbol that was carved in the picture Rowan had handed her before he was mauled to death. Wednesday quickly solves a series of riddles etched in the book and finds a clue. That is, snapping twice.
When she snaps twice, suddenly, a secret corridor opens, revealing a hidden chamber. If this academy had a beat poetry club, this portal would not be a secret. There, Wednesday successfully finds Rowan's book, from which he had torn the picture. She puts the book in her backpack, but before she can go further, someone thrusts a black sack over her head. Shortly after, when the sack is taken off, she finds herself surrounded by Bianca, Xavier, and a few more students, who are members of the Nightshades Club. Turns out, Although the group was previously disbanded, Principal Orissa reinstated it secretly. Xavier urges Wednesday to join their group, but she straightaway refuses and walks away. In the next scene, we see Principal Orissa announcing the annual outreach day, where the Nevermore students will have to mingle with normal people, also known as normies, by working alongside them at their establishments. Once they arrive in town, Wednesday tells Xavier that his roommate might have been murdered. The latter doesn't think Rowan is dead because he was only expelled. Despite this, Wednesday shows him the picture picture Rowan's mother drew. Xavier takes a close look at it and reveals that the man in the picture is actually the founder of Jericho, Joseph Crackstone. A while later, Wednesday decides to volunteer in the Pilgrim World, the place that holds Jericho's history. There, she meets Eugene, a young boy she had befriended in the beekeeping club. The two immediately get to talking and start observing the surroundings. Soon, the students are approached by Miss Arlene, the caretaker of the Pilgrim World. She gives them a tour and talks about some of Joseph Crackstone's beloved artifacts. Wednesday asks more about the artifacts and learns that they have original farm tools, tableware, and even the family chamber pot. Ew. She wants to work there, but can't because it's being renovated. Instead, they're all going to work at the Ye Old Fudgery to distribute fudge and cakes to the local tourists. Later, Wednesday, with the assistance of Eugene, sneaks into the Crackstone family chamber. She finds a painting of the old meeting house, which includes the girl from her vision. Shortly after, she also finds the book that the girl was carrying. However, when Wednesday notices that the pages are blank, she suspects it is a fake. Just then, the caretaker Arlene arrives and catches her. Wednesday asks about the original book, and Arlene hesitantly reveals that it was stolen last month. Later, Tyler and Wednesday reunite at the coffee shop. The latter inquires about Joseph Crackstone, and Tyler reveals that what is left of the original meeting house is out in the woods. It is pretty much a ruin, and meth heads use the place as a crash pad. Immediately, Wednesday and Thing enter the woods in search of Joseph Crackstone's place. They eventually find it and come across a homeless man, but Thing chokes him and scares him away. What the hell, Thing? Suddenly, Wednesday experiences a vision. This time, she travels 400 years into the past. We see the blonde girl she encountered in the earlier vision. There are villagers who are encircling the girl, as they call her the Devil's Spawn. Soon, Joseph Crackstone arises from the crowd and calls her Goody Adams. He accuses her of being a witch and condemns her to die in a barn stuffed with other accused folk, including her mother. In turn, Goody also accuses them of stealing their land, slaughtering the innocent, and robbing them of their peaceful spirit. Enraged, Joseph stares at her for a while and then sets the barn ablaze. Goody tries to free her mom, but all her efforts are in vain. At last, when there is no hope left, she escapes via a trap door. Meanwhile, Wednesday observes all of this in the barn with them. Goody soon runs up to her and claims that Joseph won't cease his crusade until he's killed them all. With this revelation, Wednesday wakes up from her lengthy vision and explains everything to Thing. I think we found someone who it's cool for you to choke, Thing. Suddenly, they see the same monster that killed Rowan lurking behind them. Wednesday runs after it in the rain but can't keep up. Hence, she follows the footprints, which strangely start transforming into a human's. This reveals that the monster is actually a human. Right then, she runs into Xavier and tells him what she saw. He wants to look at the tracks, but the rain has already washed them away. The following day, everyone reunites in the town square for the unveiling of a new statue dedicated to Joseph Crackstone. Wednesday plays an instrumental version of Fleetwood Mac's Don't Stop with the Jericho marching band while the mayor and Larissa announce the statue. However, disaster ensues when Thing, as per Wednesday's orders, sets the statue in flames. While others run away in horror, Wednesday's eyes gleam with vengeance as she swiftly plays the cello. Later, Principal Larissa tears into Wednesday, suspecting that she caused the incident. However, the teenager refuses to have done anything, and instead confronts Larissa for refusing to acknowledge the bloody racist truth on which Jericho was founded. Hell yeah. That night, the homeless man from earlier is being attacked by the monster, and his camera begins taking pictures of the incident. Moments later, the sheriff and his crew arrive at the forest ruins and find the homeless man dead. They discover footage on his camera that may reveal the culprit's face. After developing the photos, the sheriff looks upon the face of the killer, a monster born from nightmares. B.